Kate, that Thank you are you, live. Trish. Now streaming live. This is the afternoon committee of the House Appropriations uh, Committee. We on our agenda today at one o'clock, we are going to continue our discussions on H611, the Olders Vermont Act, Vermonters Act. We have Nolan Langwell here from JFO. We have Jen Carvey here with us with uh, Ledge Council. And Diane, you're going to be on speed dial with um, the two representatives from Human Services if we need help, because I think their committee uh, is meeting at this time. Is that correct? Um, so we had, um, had a request. Um, for uh, Jen to put together information regarding um, the, the similarities and differences between what we offer nursing homes at this time with rate setting and what 611 uh, proposes to do. Jen, thank you for putting together uh, this work. Um, I hope it was a quick cut and paste, but I think that you probably have some time invested in this sheet. Um, I've asked committee members to look this over uh, while we had a break between our meetings and we're, and we're either in other meetings or doing other things. So I'm, I'm hoping that there was time there to ask questions um, uh, to you regarding the differences and um, what it means for this bill and, and where it will lead us in order to um, uh, make a decision on it. We also have Nolan here to uh, look at the fiscal note to see if we make changes, if that impacts um, how the fiscal note should be written as it leaves House Appropriations. So let's first open it to committee questions. Madam For Chair, can I just say uh, Commissioner Hutt has joined oh, us now. Joined us. Oh, okay. Welcome, Commissioner Hutt. And um, can I, can, I don't see you, so I'm just going to talk <laughs> to you. Monica, did you want to um, uh, weigh in or are you here just to, uh, um, did you have anything you wanted to say first, I should ask, or are you just here to join in the conversation as questions arise? You may need to unmute yourself if you're trying to talk. Good afternoon or good morning. Oh, good afternoon. No, I didn't have anything specific, um, Representative Toll. I just wanted to be available. Thank you. We appreciate that. Sure. Struggling with the language in Section 5 um, to determine exactly what it means and how it relates to the fiscal note that we received and then um, the direction going forward. Basically, leave the bill as it is and, and take a vote or look at uh, section five and to make the language say, yes, we are supporting a definite rate increase or look at section five and decide that we want it to be more informational than a directive or to simply remove section five. So that's, those are the options that are before the committee at this time. So let's start with questions. Um, from the committee members to either the side-by-side -side comparison that was um, compiled by Jen, or if anyone has a question for Nolan or for the commissioner. I'm not seeing hands. Am I a, Teresa, am I a? You um, are a co-host, yes. Okay. So um, I have a couple of hands. I have Peter and Dave. So Kitty, I'll be the one to, to, to state what may have occurred across the board with all of us. I was too busy doing other things to be able to even look at this uh, in between our, our 1130 end time and now. So I'm trying to read down through it now. It might be helpful to actually have Jen present it if, if, because I'm, reading as fast as I can, trying to listen. So just say, just saying what happened. So Jen, let's start with that. that. That's an excellent idea. Thank you, Peter. Let's pull the side by side up. And if you could just do a quick review over um, the similarities and differences between the two groups. 
Sure. Um, so Jen Carby, Legislative Council. Um, so yes, there had been an, an interest expressed last week in uh, kind of a, a comparison of what the law says around uh, how nursing home rates are set and what H611 would do around home and community-based service provider rate inflations. Um, and so I just set out the nursing home rate setting chapter um, with a link to it if you want to actually look at the language. So uh, the nursing home rate setting chapter starts with uh, stating some reimbursement objectives, what the what the objectives are in setting the rates for nursing homes, that there be an equitable and fair balance between cost containment and quality care, um, encouraging nursing homes to admit persons without regard to source of payment, providing an incentive for nursing homes to admit and provide care to persons in need of comparatively greater care, and that it be manageable administratively for nursing homes and the state and to prevent unnecessary cost increases. Then it has a rate setting section and I skipped some of the provisions in the chapter, there are definitions, there's some other um, stuff about the composition of the division of rate setting, which had been a standalone division in the Agency of Human Services, but has now, as I understand it, been brought into um, the Department of Vermont Health Access, DIVA. So uh, as far as rate setting itself, the director of rate setting must establish by rule procedures for determining payment rates for care of state assisted persons, which for our purposes here is, is Medicaid. Um, so Medicaid rates for nursing homes and other providers as directed by the Secretary of Human Services. Uh, and it allows, gives the AHS secretary the authority to establish rates that are sufficient to ensure that certain quality standards in the long-term care facility statutes are maintained subject to some facility payment requirements in 33 VSA section 906, which you'll see in uh, a couple of squares here. Um, so then on the next page, we hit the, um, in, is where I put the inflation factor because it's the first time it showed up. So on the nursing home side, it says beginning in FY 2003, the Medicaid budget for care of state assisted persons in nursing homes, so the Medicaid budget for taking care of people on Medicaid in nursing homes, must employ an annual inflation factor that is reasonable and adequately reflects economic conditions in accordance with the division's nursing home rule. And they have a very extensive nursing home rule that includes a rather extensive uh, inflation factor formula and, and, um, and parameters. The nursing home rate determination, and we'll look at that a little bit more in a minute, um, but it uses a base year and then it adjusts the base year amount annually by inflation factors and it allows for different inflation factors for direct care and for other costs. Um, so if we compare that with the with section five, the home and community-based service provider rate inflation factor from H611, that requires the director of rate setting to establish by rule procedures for determining annual an annual inflation factor to be applied to Medicaid rates for providers of home and community-based services authorized by DIVA or Dale or both. The division in collaboration with Dale must calculate the inflation factor annually and report it to Dale and DIVA for application to home and community-based service provider Medicaid reimbursement rates beginning on July 1st. And then determination of Medicaid rates for each fiscal year must be paid based on applying that inflation factor to the prior fiscal year's rates, plus any additional payment of amounts available to these providers as the result of legislatively enacted policies that are applicable to that fiscal year. And this section five applies to home and community-based provider service provider rates beginning on July 1st, 2021. So for the FY22 year. Back to the nursing home rate setting, the basis for determination of rates in statute, um, the nursing home payment system developed by the, nurse, by the division of rate setting must include at least three cost categories. First, direct care costs, including nursing salaries and nursing assistant wages, fringe benefits and payroll taxes. Indir so there's a direct care cost, then indirect costs, which it describes as all other operating costs and property and related costs at the top of the next page. The basis for reimbursement in the direct care 
cost category must be a resident classification system that groups all residents into classes according to the similarity of their assessed condition and uh, of their required services. The direct care component must reflect necessary nursing staff time and costs to address the resident's care needs. The rates must be determined prospectively based on cost reports and it says the director must certify the rate for each facility annually by selecting a base year, setting the base year rate and adjusting the base year rate annually by inflation factors. And as we said, inflation factors can differ for direct care and other costs. The base years may be changed at different intervals for direct care and other costs, but the changes must occur at least once every three years for direct care costs and once every four years for other costs unless the secretary certifies to the legislature that it is not necessary to do so. The payment rates uh, for nursing homes, the payment for each nursing home is the sum of its per diem allowance for each cost category subject to limitations prescribed by rule. The payment for direct care costs is the function of the number of resident days of each resident class and must be adjusted in a timely manner to reflect changes in residents assessed needs. There are uh, also payment limits. The director must establish payment limits consistent with statutory reimbursement objectives to encourage the economic and efficient operation of nursing homes. The payment limits must not act as a disincentive for nursing homes to address residents' assessed needs or improve residents' conditions. And then finally, the AHSH secretary may, with 90 days notice to, to a nursing home, Reduce, reduce the number of days of nursing home service or number of nursing home beds that are Medicaid eligible in order to meet state budgetary goals, um, as long as they are maintaining the standards of care required by statute and by rule. So that is nursing home rate setting versus the home and community-based service provider rate inflation factor. They're kind of two different systems except rate setting is involved and has experience with inflation factors in both. I was talking and nobody was hearing me. <laughs> I was on mute. Peter? So, okay, thank you, Kitty. Um, so the going back up to, to page two of four, the inflation factor as it pertains to 611, uh, reading this and then Jen based on the way that you brief this to me it doesn't sound as if we have um, the ability to to say may this is a definite this is this inflation factor will shall be done each year and shall be applied to rates in order that rates will go up by that inflation factor annually there's no there's no advisory to the legislature so the legislature uh, may do something or may not do something this is a shall this is a shall. I had I had uh, written it and read it to be uh, something that that would be required to happen, short of the legislature's ability to not withstand or to not appropriate the funds. Um, but it was my understanding from last week that there was ambiguity, there was confusion among some people about whether it was required or not. And so I think if there is confusion, then it probably needs revising um, to make to make it clear, assuming that that as it leaves here, that is the committee's intent, or for the, I suppose, for the members on the floor um, who are proposing the strike all amendment. Thank you. Jen, Peter, is that, is that your, okay, that's the end of your uh, question. Uh, yes. Kimberly and then Chip. Kimberly? Yeah, thank you. Um, so to sort of state the obvious, I'm very much struck by the level of detail under the nursing home rate setting and the um, more wide, broad language that you find on 611. And I'm wondering how that impacts JFO's ability to prepare a fiscal note. And then the other thing I'm just wondering is because we're talking about home-based care, given that we're in coronavirus world and that there may be additional waves, how might we uh, expect the population to which this applies to go up. I believe the first question is for Nolan. Yeah, so Nolan Langwell, the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, well, one of the things that I, I said in my fiscal note was that um, 
we couldn't determine at this time what the rate might look like because the division of rate setting hasn't yet been told to come up with a formula for calculating the inflation factor. That's what they're doing in this rule law, which is why I said every 1% equals 900,000, but I couldn't tell you what the increase will be. I think the bigger question here is whether this is uh, a shall or a may, and because that was the question that had come up. And, and as, it's, um, as it was written, I had interpreted it as a shall, and then also based it heavily on the fact that human services, it was clearly their intent. So, so I interpret this as this, that's the intent of this, and therefore it is a shall increase the rates. So I think that's where the, the question comes in. Um, Representative Yakovone raised a very important uh, point last week, and I think that's why we're here again. Thank you, Nolan. Kimberly, do you have a follow-up for Nolan? Yeah. Do we expect in, that there, or maybe this is for Commissioner Hutt, would we expect a large growth in this population given the world we're in right now? I mean, there might be more people who are at home with kin care or other arrangements, or is that simply always the case? And we know that our demographics are such, this is gonna be a growing population anyhow. Uh, th so this is Monica Hutt for the record. Um, Representative Jessup, I think you're absolutely right. The demographics indicate that this is a growing population. Um, and this is the home and community-based portion of that population. And we continue to work really hard to make sure that people can receive their services at home and in communities. So I would anticipate growth, but even if, it, if we weren't working on that, I, again, the population and the demographics indicate that it will increase. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Kimberly, do you have a follow-up? Um, let's see, Chip and then Mary. Sorry about that. Um, so Kimberly sort of pointed out um, or did point out what, one of the things I was going to notice too, which is that it, it is telling that the, you know, that there's on the nursing home rate setting side, there's a, a fair bit of detail. And, and on the other side, the only real comparable thing is in the in setting the inflation factor. Um, and, and that just points out to me, um, you know, something that I, I'm, I'm hoping Dave will uh, speak to later, but he brought up a great, a great point I thought earlier, which is that, that what's missing from this is um, sort of the objective, the part that's on the top part of the um, nursing home uh, setting side, um, that it's not clear from this what the, what the objective of raising the rate is specifically. And I think that would be an important thing for, um, the committee of jurisdiction to, to consider and to put in there as, as intent language. Um, so I guess that's really what I wanted to say other than, um, ask, are we, did you want Kitty to have a discussion now about the, about our position on whether or not this should be, um, sort of a, a do it or don't do it, um, kind of thing, or do you want to have that discussion a little later about our, I, I think that the questions need to go out to uh, Monica and uh, Nolan and to Jen so that we don't keep them through our committee uh, through our committee discussion. However, if your discussion is going to lead to a question that you know of, it's better to get it answered by the group that's here now instead of Dave doing the follow up after. So I'll, it, I'll stop. It, stop okay, now. it just depends if we need more input from from the, the three that are joining us. Are you finished, Chip? Thank you. Uh, Mary. Thank you. Um, so I think we have clarification that at least the intention of the language was to make uh, the rate, the setting of the rate obligatory. Jen said that it was her intention for it to say this shall happen, not that it may happen. Um, I thought Dave's comment this morning was very, very interesting 
and on point in that the, a question, and I think this is to what Chip was raising, what, what are we inflating? Is what we're inflating the right dollar amount? And I don't know if that budget has been looked at and we even know that we're raising the right amount of money to provide the system of care that we need to be providing to this population, which is to Kimberly's point about its growth and what, what the changing environment is. So I guess I haven't asked a question yet. I'm just making observations. And the last observation that I'd like to make is I think a significant distinction between the nursing home world and this is in the nursing home right, um, statute, that last piece that says that there is an ability to adjust what the reimbursement is based on what the budget is. Um, and that sounds to me like a directive to AHS that they may adjust the nursing home reimbursement with a lot of provi provisions, provisos, that is not mirrored on the other side, which says to me, you can't adjust this. You have to make a payment regardless of, of, of whatever the other factors are. Um, maybe I'm interpreting that, implying an intention that may not exist, but it's just interesting. It's so clearly stated on the one side and is so silent on the other. It, it, so maybe I do finally have a question. Is that significant, Jen? Do you think? <laughs> there you go, Jen. There's the question. <laughs> All right. Um, I don't think it's significant because it was not. Uh, I did not draft this, nor did the committee, uh, the policy committee, look at aligning the nursing home rate setting um, structure with this inflation factor. Um, so you had asked for a side-by-side -side comparison, and so I've given you one, but it's not, I, I don't think it's fair to read the lack of similar language in the inflation factor as a conscious intent to do something differently than what is done in the rate setting chapter. It's not apples and apples. It's apples right. and oranges. Will, right. at a later date, somebody say, hmm, Apples and apples. I mean, how do you project that? I mean, I, you know, I, to this, I think as the legislature, you always have some degree of control over what happens and what doesn't happen because you do or do not appropriate the funds um, to to carry out what's required in statute. I think there are a lot of things that are required that don't actually happen either because they get not withstood or because insufficient funds are appropriated for that purpose. Um, so, you know, so whether, I mean, it's sort of an, it seems like it could be an artificial construct in the rate setting statute to reduce the number of um, Medicaid eligible beds with 90 days notice in order to accomplish budgetary goals. I mean, I, I'm not sure that that is, um, I th you may still have the same number of people in those beds, but you're not counting as many. I'm not sure how that works from a practical standpoint. Um, but I think, uh, you know, sometimes what ends up happening as a way of, of backing into a result. And I think that may happen in either case. I would just point out that section six of the act has a home and community-based service provider rate study and a report coming back specifically looking at the reimbursement rates, um, their adequacy and the methodologies underlying them to try to get, I think, at a lot of what you're bringing up, which is how do we know if these are the right, I think if you, you brought up, how do we know if these are the right rates? I think depending on who you'd ask, you get a different answer to that, but this has um, Diva and Dale doing that rate study and coming back to this committee and the policy committees with the, with the results. Jen, I don't have the statute and or the, the proposal in front of me. Would, would you remind me when the report is due back? Yes, the report is due by uh, April 15th. It was originally, I think, going to be January 15th, but because of pressures um, from the COVID-19 response, there was a request made to uh, the policy committee and that date and this amendment would be pushed out a few, three months. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dave. 
Thank you. Um, a statement and then a question. I guess uh, to Representative Jessup's question about um, increased uh, services that might result, uh, in my mind, I don't imagine unless you can pay people adequately that you'll be seeing more services in the home and community-based setting. And unless you provide an inflation increase, you're not going to be able to help pay people adequately. So, uh, Commissioner, a, a couple of questions, if I may. And uh, Jen's comment about Section 6 is uh, very helpful. Um, do you know if your licensing and protection rules for nursing homes speak to the requirement that nursing homes, quote, attain and maintain, end quote, the highest level of functionings for residents? Is that a federal and state requirement? Uh, it is a federal and state requirement. See, nursing homes specifically are regulated primarily by CMS. So yes, there are standards of care set out in CMS and that's what survey and certification surveys nursing homes on. So the nursing home reimbursement guidelines speak instead to reasonable and adequate and economic conditions. Does that in your mind include maintaining and attaining or is that something separate? I'm sorry, Representative, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm understanding the question. The nursing home um, law that speaks to what the rates are trying to accomplish, reasonable rates that are sufficient to meet economic conditions, correct? D does that to you also include requiring homes to attain and maintain the highest level of functioning of residents? Would that be considered a condition of reimbursement or not? I mean, I it, it's it's an interesting question. We require them to maintain um, that highest level of care, I guess, regardless of the rate. You know, it's not as if we would link a rate to. Um, it's not as if we would say, well, if we don't give you a rate increase, we totally recognize that your standards are going to slip. I think that we continue to require them to maintain the highest level of care, which I guess is not necessarily exactly how that legislation is written, but I can't see in any scenario where we would allow for a, a, a less of a quality standard if we couldn't um, adequately meet their rate requirements. And today, like I'm not answering your question at all. No, it's okay. I'm probably not very clear. So today, on the community-based side of the ledger, so to speak, there is no similar provision. Correct? There is no. Uh, you know, uh, in a, in very simple language, I have always assumed and operated my budgets over the last five years with the assumption that there had to be a rate incre increase for nursing homes. There is nothing similar to home and community-based. I will say, and I know that we've talked about this as a, as, a, as a group before, and I believe I've testified to it, and I believe you've even spoken to rate setting about this. There are multiple levers in that rate setting strategy for nursing homes where they are um, impacted negatively by less than 90% occupancy and uh, uh, numerous other factors where that rate increase doesn't necessarily, um, it doesn't end up as, as great as it sounds initially. So even from a nursing home industry point of view, I would say that it's not entirely true that that's always as helpful as it might be perceived or be seen on paper. And uh, Commissioner, does the administration support the language that requires the annual inflation increase? I, I will say, and I testified in the same way to House Human Services, um, that certainly I support this bill. I have been confused by that language um, and wondering what it actually meant. Um, I don't think that the administration even 
prior to this crisis was comfortable with an automatic rate increase. And I testified to that early on in the session. Um, and I continue to be a little bit muddy in terms of what the language requires or doesn't. It's that shall, may um, conversation that you are having now. But at the early in the session, the beginning, um, the administration, I think, had been clear that an automatic rate increase was not something that could be supported. So even if that were made more clear, you would not support it? I could not support that at this time. Could you, if, and I'm almost done, Madam Chair, thank you. Could, could you support it if there were similar language way at the bottom of the handout whereby the secretary could manage the number of, uh, uh, the quantity of services purchased? Do you see that section on the nursing homes? I don't know if it's ever been invoked but it says that the Agency of Human Services upon 90 days notice could say, you know, we normally buy uh, 600,000 patient days a year. I envision because of this inflation factor, we're only going to buy 575,000 patient days this year, manage accordingly. If there was language, I'm not advocating, I'm just asking, if there was some type of budgetary limitation language in the right-hand block that's currently empty along the same lines, would you then support it? Well, I would, I would argue um, candidly and reflect back on what Jen said earlier. I don't know that that's really a realistic mechanism. Could we really just say, no, we don't really want you to have three visits from home health. We're going to only pay for two. I don't know that that's how the program has been designed up till now. And I'm not sure that that's a realistic mechanism. Um, I think that it, you know, it, it, I think it has to be linked to what's available in the budget and the danger of a bill like this is that you're looking into budgets into the future. And I have never had the luxury of being able to plan quite honestly far into the future. You're almost always living within the budget that you're working with at the time. Do you currently put limits on sections of the Choices for Care program and set caps and say we're only going to serve a certain number of people? Um, the only program that has that, and, and again, I, I apologize, I wasn't necessarily prepared to answer a lot of questions, so I don't have all that information in front of me. But the only program that is capped in finite in that way is the moderate needs group. Um, and then of course we have the option of waiting lists in high needs and highest needs. But in my history in this department, we haven't had to implement that waiting list. But I don't believe it's capped within services because those services are built on individual need and individual plans. I think what we would end up doing is, is activating a high or highest need waiting list. So people that met high or highest need would in fact be waiting for services if we had inadequate funding for the program. Moderate so you do today, you do on the moderate needs group set a limit. Moderate needs is a is a finite pool of dollars, and so we have to match those dollars to. And you manage to that. Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Dave. Do I have any other questions for Nolan or Jen or um, Monica? Thank you, Monica. We really didn't prepare you for that, but thank you for your um, answers. Okay, so if we open it up now to committee discussion, um, the three guests, if you want to stay, you're more than welcome. I just didn't, I just didn't want to monopolize your time if, if you needed to be off for um, other work. So I'm going to unmute myself so I don't have to hold on to the space bar. Um, I, what is the committee thinking about um, a direction forward with this bill, uh, Dave? Your hand, is that from before or is this a new hand? No, I put a new hand. <laughs> there okay. we go. Um, uh, so you'd like us to speak, I guess, to whether to keep section five, is that? Uh... Well, I think I think what, there's a lot of policy in here that I, I think that the committee can have their arms around. It appears that the piece that, um, that the committee is going to struggle with is in section five, whether, um, whether uh, we want it to um, indicate for sure it's an increase, an automatic inflator, 
whether we want it to be informational that what one would look like and, and what would be, you know, what would it, it would be encompassed in it um, and then deliver it back uh, as an informational purpose or to remove it all together. So I think those well, are. Mm -hmm. Yep. I guess if I follow legislative council, it's mandatory. It's mandatory if they get an increase. And that was, I believe, uh, joint fiscal's interpretation also. And it was written as such, and the committee believed it to be as such. The administration said it was a little murky. Um, I don't know. If, I don't know if it's our place to make it less less uh, unclear or not. Um, well, it's our place to make it very clear with the position we're going to take. So, if we want an automatic inflator, we've got to make sure that the language has no questions to it. Um, okay. Okay, and, and and I think Jen, you made it you made it clear that it's it was the intent of the committee that the inflator would be put into place into action. That's my understanding. I certainly can't speak to legislative intent, but it, it was um, my understanding that the request had been for language that would create uh, effectively an automatic inflation factor. Um, so, to the extent that there is not that there is more than one read. To the language, I, I think it would be important at some point to address that. Thank you, Jen. So, Dave, you have the floor. Well, I guess I I, I believe in the concept um, uh, of helping people in need, and I and I as I'm sure the committee does. But if you go to the core of what government's all about, it ought to be to help people who cannot help themselves. And when you're talking about a population of people who need assistance with feeding, with bathing, with toileting, with moving from bed to chair, with ambulating, I can't think of a much more vulnerable uh, population um, except for abused children and they should receive the same kind of help. So it goes to the, uh, my personal beliefs are that if government can't help folks who are so disabled, what, what can it do? And you can't do that in my mind unless you pay caregivers sufficiently. So I, I and, and an inflation um, a guarantee is part of that. Adequate rates is another, that's a different issue left in section six. So if, if we believe, uh, you know, that we should help these very vulnerable Vermonters, to me, it rises up to uh, if not the highest priority, certainly certainly one of one of many, uh, and I would look myself. I would work hard to make reductions elsewhere um, in order to uh, accommodate it. Without it, it just pays lip service. When we hear people say the vulnerable are a top priority, but there's never an increase to increase their wages. It's always up to the to the legislature to do it. That doesn't set well with me and it doesn't set well to helping those that are in the greatest uh, need. I respect and understand totally that uh, I may be a, a, in a minority, and no ill will, it's just the way I feel. Sorry to take so long to explain that. Never too much time to uh, secure a position to help vulnerable Vermonters, Dave, so thank you. Um, I have Chip, Diane, Bob, Kimberly. Well, I'm sorry. Now I put my hand up right after Dave's because I'm going to try to argue the other way after he's been so eloquent about why this is important. Um, but I, I did want to have just make a couple observations first. One, um, I forgot to say when I was speaking before, just um, just to thank Jen for this really good work as she always does. But it's just so clear and concise. Uh, it was helpful and easy to read through it. Um, and I also wanted to sort of recognize that, you know, much of um, much of what's in here on the nursing home side has to do with the actual setting of the rates, how those are set. And, um, and the committee, um, our human services committee said they, they chose a different path. You know, they were going to have rulemaking and allow people who were um, knowledgeable in this area do that work. And I, and I respect that direction. I, I, I do still think that if and when you know uh, rate set or inflation rate is added, that um, that today's earlier point that 
having something in there about the objectives about what it is you're trying you're intending to do with these rates and what the inflation factor should do would need to play a role but all that said um I, dave makes a, a you know an eloquent argument about why we should think about doing this and and in you know, normal for lack of a better word circumstances I, i'd be you know I, i'd be paying I'd be thinking seriously about whether we could do it or not. I, I just can't imagine though at this moment, given how up in the air that our, our budget is for the future, what, what we're going to be able to do across state government, that it would make sense to put into, into law um, a, mand a mandatory, and I think it, I think, and Jen has made it clear as I read the legislation that that, that this would create, create the inflation rate and it would be how you would determine it would be applied to the um, reimbursement. So I, I just don't think it, right at this moment, it, I could justify saying we're going to increase spending, state government spending um, by an inflation factor and from here forward, given that we just don't know what, and we don't know exactly what that would mean in terms of the fiscal impact and that we don't know what our revenues and budgets are going to look like over the next two years, let alone um, just, you know, in the next six months or 12 months. So I, I just, there's not a, you know, my argument against trying to move forward with it, adding an inflation rate right now is really about not being able to predict. Yep, I think you're frozen. Do in oh, my back. You're back now. Can you? Okay. Anyway, um, I was beginning to ramble, so I'll stop. I just don't think I, I can't. I can't imagine that we could do this right now. I, I wouldn't be able to justify saying yes at this very moment. Adding an inflation factor that's going to go into effect on July first um, is something I could agree to. Thank you, Jeff. We have Diane, Bob, Kelly. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair, and and others. So I'll just I'll just add my my voice to the discussion at this at this point. And plus, I've I've heard back and forth that members from Human Services are listening in, and texting. So I'm I'm trying to interpret some of what their input and and bring it forward as well. But but for me, I just I also just want to make clear that this bill comes to us with the full vetted and discussion of 11 members of the Human Services Committee, which is a bipartisan, strongly supported position. This isn't didn't come to us from some sort of weak position or, or others that didn't understand what they were bringing forward. And so um, I just, just wanted to bring that to our point that, that they have vetted this for not just this year, but as you've seen me at the whiteboard for many years now, every year needing to have to come forward with these um, ways to increase this and often we're not going to be there and many times when groups come forward to what I would consider to be the fair inflationary piece they're met with oh why are they asking every year for something they are they um we're we're not making it any easier for them so number one is that this comes with their full support with what they're bringing on, on shell the other thing is that um and I'm going to look at my notes here that Teresa had said that the waiver, which I'm assuming is the waiver, the, the um, 1115 does not allow for nursing facilities to be capped as we, as, as indicated here at that last section. So it would, would not even be enforceable. But where I personally stand on this, um, I come at it from two places. Doing what's right is one thing. And then figuring out whether or not we can afford to do what's right is another question for whatever day. But from where I come from, pretending or acting as if not having the knowledge of what should happen 
is um, is sort of a backdoor of not doing what's right. And, and, and it goes to a lot of things beyond inflationary here. There we, we struggle with it in many other areas of the budget as well. Um, but case in point, uh, and we more than anybody else understand the pain of the, the property tax transfer and the, the notwithstanding and the issues that that has been. But we're perfectly capable of notwithstanding if we can't afford something. It, I believe that this would at least give us the information of what would, as this side-by-side -side indicates, a very small piece, and it goes to Dave's well said, an inflator on top of an inadequate rate is not really going to be helping sustain the system. And this goes back to that last bucket, system reform. If we want to stabilize systems, we need to recognize where the problems are. So um, with that, I'll, I'll end, Madam Chair. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you, Diane. I have Kimberly, Bob, Maida, and back to Dave. And I'd like to jump in at some point, but I'll wait to hear yeah. from you first. So I share the goal of keeping people at home. And I think the system reform in the long run, you come out ahead. The piece that I'm trying to understand, and it tags with what Diane just said, is about and what Dave said earlier about raising, putting an inflator on an inadequate wage. And the question I have is, I know in the past before I was sitting here on this committee that you all added or you raised the designated agency rates. And, and I'm just curious whether that ended up leading to less vacancies or does this sort of, and again, I'm not trying to get down a tangent, but does this get us into the workforce issue? Like even if we, had rates that were higher because we have a nursing shortage that we would still have these vacancies. And, and I don't think we exactly know the answers to that question. So I think where that leaves us is, do we go forward with the best information we have now based on the needs that we're aware of? That's to me, it seems like what the question before us is. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, Maida? Bob wasn't before me. Oh, I missed my, my blue hands. Bob, Maida, Marty, Mary. And then I'll start back with people who have already um, been. Bob? I won't be again, but I just want to say I know a representative who has asked for an inflator for years and he never got it. And he never got it because nobody wanted to step forward enough and put a dollar sign that's inflatable annually in front of another legislature. And so it never happened. And consequently, the ones that I wanted the inflator for are now barely in business. And I do mean barely. I think I don't need to go too much further on that. So I understand the use for an inflator. And David, I'm not going to say that this is the particularly good time for it. I think it's a very bad time for it. But I understand under certain cir circumstances, the need for an inflator. I'm not going to say if my cause had been a, given an inflator, it would be any better due to this last virus infection thing that brought it into a whole different world. But if it hadn't been for that, it would have helped a great deal. But, and so anyways, I guess I'm supporting you, Dave, but I'm not sure this is the time to do it, but I'll listen as we carry on, if we're all back together again. Thanks, bye. Maida, thank you, Bob. So um, I don't disagree with a word that Dave said or a word that Diane said. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, and I support this bill. 
I'm really troubled though with regard to the what to me are unknowns in that uh, section five as to so how much money would this be? Um, it's new money moving forward in a time frame when we don't know that we have enough to support um, to support ongoing programs. Um, and I guess I have a question as to if we say yes, and my God, my heart wants to say yes, but if we say yes, um, how do we say no when something else, which it will, I am sure, when something else that we care equally about that's new comes forward and how do, how do we say no? It, um, I, 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 I don't know if my um, concerns are, are, are clear or not, but that's just what I'm gonna say for now. I, I just don't feel comfortable at all with regard to saying this shall be. Um, at this point in time and go for, with regard to the inflator. Is, is there a way we can do everything else without making the inflator mandatory in this time frame? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Maida. The question is obviously yes, we either, the rest of the policy could move forward and there's certain things that our committee could uh, agree to with the uh, inflator to prepare it the information for the future if if we choose to or not to implement now um, i just i don't want to lead in the conversation i just i was answering your question Marty and mary and we'll circle back around with dave and diane and i did want to jump in my concerns are that we i just don't feel that an automatic increase in any area of the budget is the right way to go because I think we need to, we all always talk about going back and looking at the whole budget, the whole factors that are out there and determining what priorities are. And I know certain topics come up where we get enthused about them and, and we are demonstrated a great need. So we put a lot of extra money in some areas, such as when we went into child protection with the DCF issues and we put in a lot of money extra into Middle health at one point because we felt that was necessary or into child care and those are not things that happen every year but we there's kind of one topic that seems to come up every year and we put an influx in there and hope to set it off on good stead for four five six years and then we may have to make adjustments later on but I don't think the automatic increases make sense in that regard I would rather look at it and context of everything else that's in the budget that particular year. Using the notwithstand is, I don't think, a good fallback position. Sure, we can use it. But then I think that just leads into that much longer report on unfunded budget pressures that we see every year. And I don't think that makes us look very good that we've obligated these funds and yet we don't fund them. I would rather say we intentionally decide where to fund when we do need to. The other thing that I'm concerned about in this particular bill is that I don't think there are very good parameters as to what factors should be considered in developing the rates and then therefore developing the inflation rate as well. So I would, I would not want to see section number five at all. Uh, and have us simply look at the needs as they come along and try to balance them with everything else that's in the picture that particular year or look ahead two, three years in any particular topic area. Thank you, Marty. So for Mary, Peter, Diane, and Dave, we're going to have to come back to the conversation because in four minutes, we do have transportation here. 
and I do see uh, Kurt McCormick, and so I want to keep us on schedule. Um, I have the unfortunate privilege uh, to to have to um, sometimes look at things more holistically, and I just want to. I'm I'm not driving the conversation or any determination in any way, but I want to remind the committee. Um, that when we look at things with the COVID-19 money and we look at um, a very difficult bill like the Older Vermonters Act and we have more bills coming in, we have to ask ourselves uh, some questions to help guide us. And, and one is, you know, is it ongoing money or is it one-time money? And after we do that, what money is available? And then after that, if there's money that, that is available, what are our priorities? And, and I think it's been stated very clear here that this vulnerable Vermonters is a high priority. If money is not available, which is the circumstance we're in now, where right now we're between a 200 and a $230 million gap. Um, first, um, if, if we were to agree to move forward with this inflator, we would need to know what we are not going to do. And so once we figure out what we're not going to do, then I want to move to the next step, which is we have asked the administration and, and, and asking ourselves that in the quarter, in, in the first phase bill, you know, our transition bill, that we do not make major reductions to programs at this time until August, because in August we'll have a consensus forecast. And so between now and August, I, I have to ask the committee, do we put forth a major bill? How do we, I'm not saying do we, how do we put forth a major bill without any money to pay for it? And there is money, but in order to do that, we need to make reductions on top of about $200 million but those may not all be reductions by the time because we have no idea what's going to come with CRF money and, and other dollars. But we have to make some major reductions and system changes. But at this point right now, what would we reduce? And are we in a position right now to um, make a reduction because our committee generally does, in my time on the committee for the last 10 years, has not gone out of balance. So we just have to, that path forward is what I want us to think about. Um, I do not believe, I know CRF dollars are never going to cover this because it's an ongoing expense and it won't go away on December 31st. So it's ongoing dollars that we need to be very clear about. And I don't mean to be the skunk at the long party I just want to make sure that when we make decisions on this bill, justice reinvestment, and whatever other bills are coming our way, that we always keep the whole picture um, in focus because that's our job is the whole picture, the whole budget. Sorry about that. I feel I feel I feel like the wicked stepmother is what I feel like that I have a child in need and I'm saying sorry, I just don't have enough to go around. And I don't want that to be our answer. What else, what, what do I need to do differently in that household to make something important happen? And until I can figure it out, it's difficult to make a change. So I'm gonna leave us with that because it's at two o'clock and I wanna transition now into transportation.